Uh, my name is Colin McCluskey. Uh, I am a sleep enthusiast, which means I'm not an actual board certified sleep physician because EM folks can't be boarded in that, which is surprising given the amount of shift disturbance that we have as part of our job. So I do both EM, critical care night shifts, as well as, you know, being a father of two and trying to be healthy and all of this. So this is a big part of my life that I try to optimize, which is sleep. And I wish that kind of I had optimized it and started teaching on this sooner. Now it's a Wednesday morning and you've just done an eight hour overnight in the ED. Standard ED stuff, you know, traumas, gunshot wounds, semis, all these things, all right? This night three out of four and you're looking forward to going home. You live about 25 minutes away right? And you've made this drive hundreds of times. And you're a pro at driving home when sleepy. Windows down, air conditioning up. We're putting on our, you know, our favorite music. We've all been, I'm seeing a lot of nods of like, oh yeah, this, <laughs> this is not good, by the way, bad foreshadowing. Um, and uh, in fact, you're calling your best friend because you're like, hey, I'm, I'm really worried. We're going to talk, talk through this. You fall asleep two minutes from your home cross the median and hit a 70 year old male who's anticoagulated in a head-on collision going about 45 miles an hour. This gentleman suffers a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage that requires anticoagulation reversal. He also has multiple rib fractures and ends up standing about two weeks in the trauma ICU before having to go to rehab before eventually making it home. You don't do much better, all right? You break your wrist. You suffer a hemothorax that uh, one of your colleagues gets to put a chest tube in for. And also you sublux your clavicle and cause a subclavian artery injury leading to a vascular surgery procedure. Right. You're going to spend a couple uh, a couple days in the trauma ICU before being released home. There's one sleep related fatality an hour in the US. And this is when we, uh, we are a very underslept society. Right. And this can happen to you as much as anyone else who is trying to get home after a night shift or after any duration of sleep disturbance. And one of the, cul the cul culprits here is microsleeps. You can be awake talking to your friend, AC on, music up, and cross a median. I've been awakened by rumble strips coming home, or thank goodness for adaptive like steering control that like jerks you back. Unfortunately, I've been in that boat as well. So this is a real problem that even despite your best efforts, you will not be able to combat. And on top of just falling asleep, <laughs> that's hard to, hard to drive well when you're asleep. Your reaction time's terrible. If you've been up for about 20 hours, which if you're working night shifts, if you're working a 12 hour night shift and you were on before, you are functionally intoxicated. And we've actually seen this in um, kind of reactivity testing, right? And it's not even if you're just up for a prolonged period of time. If you're chronically underslept despite getting sleep, you still have increased risk of traffic collisions. And that risk increases with how bad your sleep hygiene is. So what to do? All right. Please, post shifts. <laughs> like, I've slept in my car. It's fine. No judgment. Like, that's fine. Um, our residency now mandates that we cover e some sort of ride share for our residents going home. Or if you have a call room or an office or a, a futon, I don't know, uh, spend some time there before getting into a car trying to go home if you think you're that, if you're that tired. So if the risk of dying or hurting someone else on the ride home isn't enough, let's slay some dumb sleep beliefs that you might have that is, forcing, or that is preventing you from taking this seriously. The first is that there's some of you that probably get about four, five to six hours every night, have been doing it for a decade, and you think you're a superhuman. Uh, some people can exist with less than five hours of sleep without any deleterious to your effects. 
And I'm here to tell you that you are not them. All right. Uh, that person on a population level rounded to a, um, the, a whole number is zero. So it's unlikely to be you. And what is in fact happening is your body has gotten used to how bad you feel and how bad you perform and thinks that that is now optimal. The human body is awesome in that way. Give yourself a good week of sleeping at eight hours and you'll be like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Please do that. The second thing is, hey, I'm tired, but hey, I've, I've got life responsibilities. I have family. I have a paper due. I'm just going to like bust through with caffeine. Hey, I'm seeing a lot there. I had a cup of coffee this morning. A couple problems with it in related to sleep. One, you have no idea what your metabolism of caffeine is. All right. Some folks can have a double espresso after sleep and their, like, their sleep scan is completely fine. If I have caffeine after noon, my sleep is a problem, right? There are ways to figure this out with some like epigenetic testing these days, but like be careful about when you time. And if you are in the, um, if you do have caffeine too late, you're basically subtracting an hour of sleep from your overall. And on top of that, the quality of sleep you get with caffeine on board is far less. You spend less total time in NREM and REM and more light sleep, which is where you're, you're losing some of the benefit. Say you're not a caffeine human, but you're popping other pills. You're on Team Ambien. Um, not a good plan. All right. There are other sleep hygiene things you should do. The first off is that you can develop a psychological tolerance to this medication. You're tired, so you pop a Zolpidum. That then leads you to go to bed and then wake up groggy because Zolpidum is a sedative hypnotic. And then all day you feel groggy then leading to more Zolpidem, and you can understand the concern. This becomes problematic, especially if you have any underlying mood disorders. There is some association in the literature with Zolpidem use and increase of depressive symptoms, including suicidal thoughts. And lastly, for anyone who's looking to have a family or to add another one, there has been some association with Zolpidem use with preterm birth, interuterine growth restriction. So these are medications that a lot of people are using off-label without a doctor's prescription or monitoring that have health effects that are real. All right. So I want you to go home and get home with the car. Two, I don't want you to undersleep or take any medications that'll mess with your sleep. And the reason for this is chronically, this may be at probably worse than smoking for you. All right. Less sleep equals worse mental health. The direction between poor sleep and mental health is bidirectional. There's not a um, psychiatric condition in DSM-4 or DSM-5 that doesn't have sleep disturbance as part of it. And we also know that folks with pre-existing mental illness will have exacerbations of all their symptoms under sleep deprivation. So it's a two-way street. Further, if you're underslept, you're going to be overfed. If you've ever been to an emergency department at two in the morning, right? There's nothing but donuts. <laughs> there's nothing but, you know, other, other things around that aren't great. When you look at night shift workers compared to those that work in the day, they generally eat about 300 calories more. Over a year, that's about 10 to 15 pounds. Further, sleep deprivation of healthy college athletes, which most night shift ED workers are not. If you do three days without sleep, they functionally are now type 2 diabetics with their degree of insulin resistance. So we know there's, that this is going to lead to increased metabolic syndromes, which then leads to acute coronary syndrome. We have an awesome natural experiment in uh, the Western world every year called daylight savings. When we lose an hour of sleep, the, uh, the incidence of heart attacks goes up 20%. Six months later, we reverse it goes down 20%. So acute sleep disturbance also in the context of pre-existing cardiovascular disease is a problem. And it's not just your waistline. It's not just your mental health. It's not just your cardiac health. We know in folks that get poor sleep, they have worse beta amyloid clearance and on a population level, higher rates of Alzheimer's. So those golden years will not exist unless you take sleep seriously today. All right. So how do we opt? Oh, last thing, public health, right? You have a 70% reduction 
in antibody production following a vaccination if you don't get good sleep. So all of you, it's getting into flu season. Make sure you get a good night's sleep around that vaccination. All right. The scare tactics have worked. You look wrapped. All right. So how do you optimize sleep? So the first thing is you have to give yourself the opportunity. All right. Our, nobody is 100% sleep efficient. Generally, the best folks are around 90%. So if you want the recommended seven to nine hours, depending upon where you are, you need to spend one hour more than what you're hoping to get in bed. All right. So if you think, hey, I'm going to get eight hours, I'm going to go to bed at 10 and wake up at six. Incorrect. The best you're probably going to get is seven. All right. So try to give yourself the opportunity to get this done. The second is avoid the nightcap and instead get drunk at brunch, right? Brunch is phenomenal. There's waffles. There's maybe some melon. Um, it, you know, it's going to be phenomenal. You get your Mai Tai, your Bellini, but you get enough half-lifes that you avoid the deleterious effects of alcohol on your sleep, which are myriad, right? It um, reduces the time you spend in sleep stages. You're going to have nocturnal awakenings due to the diuretic effect of alcohol. It may exacerbate any pre-existing sleep apnea. Do not do the nightcap. Instead, start a bedtime routine. We have morning routines. You know, we have your affirmation in the, in the mirror. You're, you're thinking about maybe some push-ups. You're figuring it out. Figure something out for the end of your day. All right. You already do habits at the end of the day. Most people are brushing their teeth, washing their face. There's something that habits stack on top of that. There's decent data saying that mindfulness or meditation, some sort of practice, is going to increase parasympathetic tone, which is soporific. Fantastic. Journaling, especially for those of you who hit the pillow and then start to catalog all of the anxieties you've had through the day. I have an anxiety journal at my bedside that I'm like, when am I going to get my slides done for Resus X? Oh, that'll be tomorrow. And I write that down and that cognitively offloads it such that my mind is not going to repeat it. And then read a book, um, whatever you want, hopefully on paper, in kind of natural light. This will help slow your mind down and get there so you can actually fall asleep. Last thing, we've evolved from, you know, living on the savanna and or caves. And that's what your bedroom should look like, a cave. It should be dark. It should be cold and delightful service animals aside. It should be without any wild animals. All right. Because this is going to be good for your overall sleep hygiene. Dark, wear a mask, cold, less than 65 degrees. And don't let, like I used to, my Great Dane sleep with me. They'll just push me off the bed. Not very good. All right. And then track your sleep. There's a variety of things out there. There's whoops. There's Uro rings. I think even the most rudimentary is when did you get into bed and when did you wake up? In that same journal, are you getting that nine hours of opportunity to get eight hours of sleep? What is measured is managed, and sleep is one of those things that needs to be optimized if you want to optimize human performance. That's Dr. Jardella, that tall, striking lady. She was the one who fell asleep at the wheel. She was a second-year EM resident in our program. She went on. She's done fine. She found out during her TICU hospitalization that she was pregnant with her first child and now has two kids. It's an attending in our system. is wonderful. This is her accepting her award for a resident of the year. So we almost lost one of our highest performing resuscitationists due to sleep fatigue. Please take this seriously. Take a chance to optimize your sleep. And thank you.